Welcome to AUSA's Army Matters Podcast. This is Thought Leaders with Joe Craig. My guest today is John Michael Sheck, author of Blood, Guts, and Grease, George S. Patton in World War I. John Michael Sheck is professor of history at the United States Army Command and General Staff College and American Military University. He's the author of General Mark Clark, commander of U.S. Fifth Army and liberator of Rome, and the co-author of Operationing Enduring Freedom, 2002 to 2005. John, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So we are all familiar with Patton as the legendary general from World War II. Why did you decide to focus on his service in the First World War? Uh, there's a few reasons. Is uh, One of the main reasons was when we think of Patton, we think of George C. Scott standing in front of a giant flag, uh, giving a uh, HUA speech. And with the 100th anniversary of World War I, I was thinking about how Patton got to that stage in front of a flag in a movie. And this was kind of his origin story of where Patton first receives some kind of fame, uh, some kind of responsibility, a command. And it's where he learns to kind of become the, what will become George Patton, the one we all know and uh, most mostly love. Great. So, you know, even before you get to World War I, you start the story with General John Pershing's expedition to Mexico. Can you tell us what happened and how it's significant for Patton's career? Yeah, I decided to uh, start with the uh, Mexican campaign uh, for a couple reasons. Is It's a good start to his... Uh, really his formal military career. He had just been out of West Point a few years. Um, he had been doing the typical early turn of the century, slow promotion rate kind of jobs. Mm -hmm. And it's what I thought more importantly about his, his experience there was it's where he first comes in contact with uh, John Pershing. And Pershing will have a big impact on his career, Patton's career, and a bunch of other generals that will become uh, known, successful in World War II. And the other reason was it's just not that well known. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a few books on Patton. Many of them are all, almost all of them focus on World War II. And the Mexican Expeditionary Force, whose World War I experience tends to be um, not forgotten, but it, it's not a main event. So for listeners unfamiliar with it, can you just give a quick uh, overview of what happened down there? The Pancho Villa. And his uh, raiders were going across the border and they hit a couple towns in the United States. And Wilson, then President Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, uh, got an expeditionary force together under the command of Pershing to kind of hunt down Pancho Villa, mm -hmm. his lieutenants. And it's very similar to, if you put it in a modern context, kind of what the U.S. was looking for in, in uh, Osama bin Laden. It's kind of the same. It was a manhunt to find one person mm -hmm. and they go into Mexican territory. And the that's kind of where the story starts for Patton and Pershing. Right. And, and so you're talking about Pershing and you talk about the connection, personal connection he has with Patton. So when Patton goes off to Europe for, for the war, he's serving as one of Pershing's staff officers. Why would he choose to leave that uh, to go for the tank service? On one hand, he understands he's working day to day with John Pershing, who is going to become the big the big hero, the big general of the war for the United States. Right. It's good for his job. It's good for promotion. But then there's a warrior side of Patton. And he got a little bit of he was in a little bit of a fight of it's kind of an overblown event in Mexico, which is the Patton referred to it as the first mechanized infantry attack in U.S. Army history, mm -hmm. which is when he um attacked and killed one of Pancho Villa's lieutenants. Um, but he was torn. He wanted to be in command, as you know, and he will. he's always looking for medals. Right. And he understood he would not receive fame, medals, glory in a staff position. The idea of a tank corps, tank command begins to develop. And Patton, who was very much into automobiles, mm -hmm. uh, he's very mechanical, uh, good working with his hands was immediately interested in tanks. Right. Didn't know anything about them because in 1917, not many did. Uh, but the idea of starting at the front of a new branch of service or a tank corps was appealing to him because he said he was thinking, if I'm at the, the when this tank corps opens up, I'm going to be one of the main guys. 
Yeah, I mean, we should mention that, you know, at this point, you know, he's talking about joining the American tank corps, but the Americans didn't actually have any tanks. So it was all British and French. Yeah. So uh, you should probably talk about uh, British and French tanks. You know, what were the different tanks available and what, what were their different theories about tank warfare? Yeah, and this, this will be a problem Patton will have to deal with throughout the war and then in the interwar period. Uh, in 1917, tanks are new. They're mainly uh, devised, implemented, built by the British and the French. Uh, the British tended to view tanks as um, infantry carriers. They relied on the Mark tank, which was a much bigger, heavier tank to get across no man's land. Mm -hmm. And then there was the French um, that built, they had heavy tanks as well, but they relied more on light tanks. And the tank of choice was the Renault tank, which was a smaller two-man tank. Uh, I compare it more to a modern tank where it's, an, it's a weapon, not mm -hmm. a infantry carrier. Right. Um, and the one issue, <clears throat> and you will see this throughout military history of new weapons, is when a new weapon is made, built, it doesn't mean immediate success. What the patent had to work with is figure out doctrine. And there was no tank doctrine. And within the tank corps and the tank community of World War I, which was small, they were not independent as they will be in World War II. They're not attacking. Uh, they're not the tip of the spear as they will be for the Germans and the Americans in World War II. The armies of World War I are heavily infantry and rely on artillery. And these tanks come in and no one knows exactly what to do with them. The tankers themselves don't know. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have a problems, as modern tanks still do. They run out of gas. They break down. And the pr main problem the allies are going to have with tanks, besides mechanical issues, is how to incorporate them in a combined arms approach to warfare. He really gets into the mechanical side of the tanks. And he's and drawn to the to the French Renault because those are the, the, the more offensive uh, oriented tanks versus the British heavy tanks, right? Yeah, and there's I think the other reason is Patton was a Francophile, loved anything French. Sure. His wife, Beatrice Patton, who um, is where he gets a lot of his wealth from mm -hmm. and made a lot of- Which helped when studying automobiles. And stuff, oh, it helped his automobile habit. Um, and then Patton, at a whim, when he's a just a captain, will buy a Packard uh, in Paris mm -hmm. for, I think, I can't remember the exact price, $4,500. Uh, he just drops that without really thinking. And in today's world, that's about $90,000. And the he does have to write to his wife to explain that he spent a large chunk of money <laughs> and to uh, wire him more money. Right. Uh, but he generally tended to love anything French. He was fairly fluent in French. His wife was educated in France. Mm -hmm. So the Renault tank appealed to his French leanings. Right. But for Pat, I think you're right. It's it, He understood it was a little more reliable. It was more aggressive than, say, a Mark tank, right. which had a lot more reliability issues than these Renault tanks. And then with Patton being you know, drawn more towards the, the light French tank, uh, you know, it turns out that he selected as director of the light tank school for the Americans, right? Uh, then Colonel Samuel Ro uh, Rokenbach is uh, chief of the tank corps. Yes. They're not exactly compatriots. You know, they have, how would you describe their relationship? Um, that's a, and that's one I tinkered around with the book. Uh, they have a kind of love hate relationship. And I even mentioned the book. This tends to be a trend in Patton's life, his career. He tends to not get along with some of his superiors, uh, though what he fails to appreciate is Rockenbach does a very good job protecting Patton from a lot of political issues, a lot of administrative issues. And Patton, as he will in World War II, will seem to be oblivious to this. Mm -hmm. He will view Rockenbach as kind of an annoyance, as someone that is kind of in the way. There's a big age gap, right? Big age gap, personality differences. Um, Rockenbach actually, he they were not ever close. They did stay in contact a little bit. And, and even in, when World War II, when Patton is now more world famous, mm -hmm. Rockenbach is interviewed, speaks very highly of him, even mentions that they didn't always get along. Um, Rockenbach, and it, the reason he's kind of forgotten is because he's outshined by Patton later on in the war. Rockenbach doesn't, uh, he's older, doesn't serve in World War II. He's mm -hmm. kind of forgotten man in tank history. Uh, but he was really ideally suited for that job as opposed to Patton. 
Well, they do, you know, they do work together and get the tank core off the ground and they're about to face their, you know, first true test uh, at the Samuel Samuel uh, salient. Yes. So, can you uh, tell us what Patton's tank battalion is supposed to do during that engagement and how would you describe Patton's command style during the engagement? Uh, so his command style even before the engagement as he's the head trainer is very if, for those that have understand Patton World War II, if you have read some of the speeches, it's very similar. Um, it's hit this aggressive attitude, profanity lay speeches, mm -hmm. all start in World War One. Uh, there's a few letters, journals, comments from his junior officers that most of them had a positive view of Patton. They enjoyed his profanity lay speeches, some more than others. His father was uh, not a fan. Of no, not and his father definitely wasn't and will never be. Um, and his wife, too, told would was sometimes a little ambivalent towards it. But it's as she would say, it's Georgie being Georgie. Mm -hmm. um, he was very aggressive. He wanted his officers to lead from the front. And that is why his officers will have a high casualty rate. And that's partially it's not a knock on Patton. It's the technology. The Renault tanks had, in most tanks of World War I, had poor visibility. And the other issue is if you were on the taller side, 5'9 or more, getting in a Renault tank was not really going to happen. Patton, six feet, six one. Um, he made his officers, and this was not uncommon, this was not a Patton thing. Uh, they led by walking the tanks out. And so his officers mm -hmm. are going to be trained to be aggressive, to be bold and to put themselves in harm's way. And Patton will do that himself. And in fact, he will get in trouble by rocking back after the uh, first engagement because Patton will go to the front mm -hmm. and is a brigade commander of tanks. He should be more tied into the communication. Back and the command post, not out. Yeah, and Patton will leave and he'll do it in the Meuse-Argonne offensive too. And um, we'll get to that and see what happens there. But he, he will send runners out. But in his first engagement, he doesn't pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. And he's out in front. And what his the tanks had a small role in the reducing the salient. Um, but he wanted them to be aggressive, to attack, to take out the machine gun nests, to uh, make it easier for the infantry. And he will train his soldiers and officers to do that. They will do a good job. At the end of the, the when the salient is reduced, it's kind of a hollow victory for Patton and his tank corps. Uh, the Germans, as we, some of us know, they retreated. They did not stand and fight. And that was a decision on the Germans to kind of give up the salient and, and fall back to their lines. And Patton will be so, he will be upset that there was not more fighting, not more. He wanted to face the best. He, enemy could yeah, try. he wanted to show his, the world what the tanks could do. Um, well, he, he did. He did have an important development there with uh, what they call Task Force McClure. Yes, yeah, that is a in itself almost could be a book depending on the sources. Um, he that is the Task Force McClure was a good example of the future of tanks, the potential of tanks. Uh, McClure was a lieutenant, and with his tanks, they really went very far into the German defenses on their own. They mm -hmm. lost communication. Uh, I also think they had a good day for their tank. Their tank did not break down, run out of gas. And McClure's task force, as it will become known as, uh, Patton will think about that during the interwar period, and he will kind of have that in the back of his head when he begins to envision the future of war um, and how – Tanks can be the tip of the spear. They can be an independent branch. Right. Um, and all things considered, despite the German lack of standing and fighting, the tankers do a good job. Patton receives letter of congratulations from Rockenbach, Pershing, um, other division commanders. And it's a good start for, for Patton, for the U.S. Army Tank Corps. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a good, as they refer to as a baptism to fire, mm -hmm. baptism of fire. Um, and the casualties are relatively low and they do learn a lot of lessons, uh, mainly about refueling, keeping the tanks fueled, uh, as the tanks will run out of gas and Patton in the next operation will come up with a unique idea to fix that as he just chains gas tanks that are dragged by the tanks. Mm -hmm. And that way they can, uh, use the fuel 
when they're needed. It's probably something that would not work in today's army, but it was effective. But he was willing World to War take I. the risk. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if this is a total war, you can get a, there's a lot less red tape right. and world wars and total wars. Well, you, I mean, you talk about the baptism by fire and uh, get ready, you know, they're getting ready for their next test immediately with the, the Mujan Gan offensive. And you, you talk about Patton and the other commanders before the battle going out and like physically surveying the terrain for the tanks. And, uh, can you tell us like why they do that? What exactly are they looking for? Yeah. So Patton was very focused on reconnaissance and he understood the tanks of World War I, because of the limitations they had, they only could work on certain ground. And there are parts of France, Belgium, uh, and, and during the season, the rain made it hard for tanks. These are, uh, when people envision tanks, modern tanks now, these mm-hmm. things can go 70 miles an hour, go over any terrain. These tanks had to be on dry ground. Any mm-hmm. rain tended to slow them down. It would also burn a lot more fuel. And that will be a problem. And the tanks, too, had to be railroaded. They had to take a railroad in. They could not go from their headquarters, drive five miles to the front, then fight. It would take too much gas to get Too much there. gas. And most of the tanks would probably have broken down before they got there. Now, you know, given the, the limit of, uh, of the tanks, what, what exactly is their role? What are they trying? You know, what, what's their tactics during the actual engagement? Um, what Patton wanted his tanks to do was to help support the infantry. They had to stay together, which was very hard to do just because of the mm-hmm. communication visibility. Uh, the tanks, what he wanted them to do, and they will do pretty successfully in World War One, is they're very good at taking out machine gun nests, which really is what is, in, along with the artillery, is going to kill all those infantrymen. Um, the tanks themselves, the, tank, the uh, soldiers in the tanks, they had a high casualty rate, but a lower fatality rate. Mm-hmm. Um, and the tanks, machine gun fire didn't do a lot. And the only the only thing they had to be wary of was was artillery direct hits. Right. Uh, the Germans will come up with countermeasures that will be somewhat effective. Um, but a lot of these tanks will just break down, and that will be the problem. There is no recovery. They will have Patton has a recovery maintenance company but they do not go to the front. There are no wreckers to move these tanks. And this will, the absence of doctrine, what Patton will do because he is aggressive, this kind of fits his personality, his command style, is he tends to tell his, his tankers to dismount if the tank is broken, breaks down. Mm-hmm. It's, you have to leave the tank, grab a rifle, and go out and meet the enemy. And that lead from the front style that you're talking about for Patton, uh, during the Muse Argonne, it almost gets him killed. Can you? Talk oh, yeah. There. <clears throat> and that is exactly what happens. And this is not Patton it will write a lot about his wounding um, and we'll, we'll get into why. But this is in 100 looking at it 100 years later. It's almost comical to see what Patton did. What Patton will do is following uh, the first operation in September, Rockenback will will yell at Patton. He will not officially uh you know, he's, he's not in any legal trouble, losing his job, losing his command. But he reprimands him for leaving. <clears throat> but Rockenback says you have to stay in communication. So Patton, in very Patton fashion, will bring extra runners with him. Mm-hmm. And so he will try at first, when the Muse Argonne campaign kicks off, to stay back. But it, there's something in Patton that it just prevents that. And you can even, he in his j- journals, his diaries, letters home, he all, you can almost see the conflict in his brain and he's right. working it out he knows he has orders from above to stay mm-hmm. but he also understands he needs to be there for his troops yeah you mentioned a letter that uh Rokin back later writes to beatrice saying if, if he told george if i find you in a tank doing the job of a private i'm going to relieve you of command yes so and says i'm not going to be in the tank <clears throat> yeah Patton will be he'll be on a tank and Patton did have a tendency to sit on top of tanks mm-hmm. into battle or into a fight. Um, there's a few times um, he's sitting on top of a tank and machine gun fire starts hitting and he has to jump off. He almost gets killed earlier because the tank he was on didn't know he jumped off. And Patton will actually have to zigzag across a field to avoid getting killed. And mm-hmm. he's by himself. Uh, in regards to his wounding, what happens is the, uh, the tanks have gone ahead of the infantry 
And what happens when he finds the tankers breaking down, he finds about 100, 150 soldiers. They're not all tankers. Some of them are from infantry units that have just been lost. Mm -hmm. And as a colonel, he takes charge and he is a cavalry officer. So this is not completely foreign to him. And he gets them together and kind of is a ragtag unit. They go in and advance to fight the Germans and Patton without because, again, they had no uh, there's no ISR assets. They don't know the terrain as well as they would think. And he leads them basically into a German ambush. And a, a lot of the soldiers are killed and Patton is wounded. He's sh he shot in the butt. Mm -hmm. um, and this is whether comical because when you see where he is wounded people now 100 years ago that's a pretty good wound to have you're gonna get shot that's where you want to get shot he is losing a lot of blood and this is where the Patton myth kind of begins too and this the focus of Patton having past lives when Patton's lying in a foxhole or foxhole a shell hole um he invit he looks up to the sky and he vividly recalls that he saw his ancestors who died in the Civil War. This is after he was shot. This is after he shot. Um, again, this is all very quick. They don't know this. If, how, he is losing a lot of blood. They don't know how serious it is. He is getting weaker. He Patton does try to walk mm -hmm. to uh, rally the troops and he just falls over. And um, his assist, his aide is telling him basically to stop moving, calm down. Mm -hmm. And he looks up to the sky and he sees his lost relatives welcoming him in to Valhalla, as he puts it. And he, Patton, I think for he thought he was probably going to die. Um, and he writes very long letters about what he envisioned, what he saw. And what's going to happen is the after about an hour, hour and a half, maybe more, uh, he the ambulance, deli they take him out and um, he is rushed to a hospital. They perform, they remove the bullet went through him. So they didn't have a lot of issues there. Mm -hmm. And he will be sent to a hospital and he will slowly recover. Yeah, he and, misses basically all the campaign, right? Yeah, the mute, the whole operation is he is gone for it because uh, he's wounded in the early hours of it. Um, and command will will fall to um, to Brett, one of his his really his chief lieutenant. Mm -hmm. Patton will be upset about this because right. he wanted to be in this big operation, and this unlike the first. Uh, operation reducing the salient. This is a real fight. This is one of the higher casualty counts in American military history. Mm -hmm. um, his tankers are going to sustain a lot of casualties. A lot of his uh, his platoon leaders, company commanders are going to be killed and he will miss it all. And as he recovers in the hospital, he, he doesn't really lose consciousness for too long. Uh, he's more annoyed by his wound, not healing fast enough right it festers uh they have to clean it out time and time again and even in world war one you have more uh deaths from disease than combat uh but he's the problem Patton will have is he feels fine and he thinks he could be back at the job but the uh medical folks the docs won't let him right and he misses the entire campaign and he will then begin to fight for certain medals because of his wounding. Yeah, so while he's laying in hospital bed, he's having dreams of Medal of Honor, right? He desperately wanted a Medal of Honor mm -hmm. throughout his entire life. Um, he will try his best to get a Medal of Honor. He will write letters, and if you read all his letters, diaries, they contradict at times that some, depending on the day, he will be happy with the Distinguished Service Cross. Uh, the other times, he will be livid. He will even think about rejecting, accepting the Distinguished Service Cross. Right. Which um, he does actually end up getting, right? Yeah, he, that's what he gets. Uh, Distinguished Service Medal as well. And that is a very high award. But for Patton, it's not... Number two is not good enough. Not good enough. No. And he actually, when he gets promoted to colonel, full colonel, he even writes that he would have preferred the Medal of Honor over the promotion. And partially that is he knows when the war is ending, he's going back to a captain. Right. And so his war rank is rather meaningless. And if you get a Medal of Honor, he will get that. He gets to wear that on his uniform. It's known throughout the rest of his life. And where some of his letters home are not, it doesn't show Patton in 
a real good light. Well, I mean, you mentioned, you know, what happens to the rank after the war is over. And basically, by the time he recovers from the wound, the war does end. You know, after the, you've got the armistice. So what happens to Patton after the armistice and what happens to the tank corps? Patton's distraught when the war ends. And he writes a lot that he hopes the armistice will be broken. And one of the main reasons he wants the war to continue is he knows he kind of missed out on the big operation. Mm -hmm. He did not get a Medal of Honor. And if the war were to continue, he has a shot. Right. And it's it's kind of it's not real well received. I imagine if Europeans read that in 1918, some American that had been in the war for a year wants the war to continue so he can get awards. Uh, but it's he was disappointed. And he also understood, too, that. Until the next big war, he was going to go back to the traditional slow promotion rate, mm -hmm. going back to the conventional things that the army had been doing for the last 50 years. And his time in command, his time in the Great War was over and he was disappointed. And he decides he's <clears throat> going to go back in the army, you know, stay in the army, yep. but not with the tank corps. Yeah, he, there was never any doubt about leaving the army. He is slightly torn on whether or not to stay in the tank corps. And this is another thing. Patton is politically savvy enough to understand what the future holds. He is there's a he balances it out. If he decides to stay in the tank corps, he will have an important position. But he refers to the tanks as a specialty branch. Mm -hmm. And he knows specialty branches do not become specialty branch officers don't become general officers. And that's what he wants. And so he early on realizes he was is going to go back to the cavalry. Uh, he will stay in the tank corps for a couple years after the war ends, and he will be one of the foundational thinkers for the tank doctrine. Now, in, in the book, you you know you make the point that Patton is the the first tanker in U.S. Army history. Would you, in closing, still you know characterize him as the greatest tanker? <laughs> um, sure, why not? Um, he is <clears throat> the first, and he is most synonymous with tanks. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't, you know what? I don't have a problem with that. I think it's safe to say he's the greatest tanker. All right. Well, I, I appreciate you sitting down with us and I uh, want to thank John Michael Sheck for uh, being our guest. Uh, John's new book is Blood, Guts, and Grease, George S. Patton in World War I. And to all our listeners, thanks for joining. Be sure to subscribe to Army Matters Podcast on iTunes and everywhere podcasts are found. Visit AUSA.org for more info. Keep it locked here for all Army Matters and for next week's episode with Soldier Today. Have a great Army Day.